Welcome back, everybody. This is Todd Sylvester with the Todd Sylvester Inspires Belief Cast. Thank you once again for joining me today. Um, I want to give a shout out to our sponsor, Veracity Networks, and my good friend, Drew Peterson. Thank you for believing in me and helping us get the word out of this. And I want to thank all you listeners for tuning in week after week. I mean, I it's crazy. We just hit over 110,000 downloads, and I just can't thank you guys enough. It just blows my mind. That's where we're at. And I think it's based on not only you guys, but I have amazing guests on all the time. <laughs> and today's going to be no different. Uh, we have Liana Gurgley. Thanks for joining us today, Liana. Hi, thank you so much for having me. So happy to be here. You betcha. Well, let me give you guys a little background on Liana. She is a self-help writer, meditation teacher, and a spiritual coach, coach based out of Los Angeles, California. Her work focuses on women in their 20s and 30s who struggle with anxiety attachment style, which we'll get to learn more about, that affects their romantic, personal, and professional relationships. And I can't wait to hear more about this. Um, you've had experience in training through the 12-step recovery and, a Buddhist, and through Buddhist meditation. You help overthinkers heal from their approval-seeking perfectionism and low self-esteem with practical spiritual tools. And I'll tell you, you know, I've, I've been doing coaching for 31 years now. And I would say without fail, every client struggles that I deal with, with anxiety and overthinking. <laughs> so I'm excited to hear your perspective. And, uh, but before we get to that, uh, Liana, I want, why don't you tell us where you grew up and about your family and a little bit about your childhood? Yeah, absolutely. So I grew up in Los Angeles. I actually, um, have been living in New York for the last 10 years and right at the start of the pandemic, okay. moved back to my hometown. So that has been quite a journey. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I grew up here and uh, come from a relatively traditional Jewish family. Um, yesterday was actually Holocaust Remembrance Day and both oh, of wow. my dad's parents were Holocaust survivors. So that definitely colored wow. a lot of um, my upbringing and the Judaism with which I was raised. Um, again, pretty, pretty traditional on the outside family. Dad is a doctor. Mom is uh -huh. a professor, um, really highly valuing the intellect and, uh, critical thinking, um, which we'll talk about a little bit, how that kind of plays into my work and some of that overthinking that you mentioned. Yeah. Um, and I have three sisters. So a lot of women in the house, my parents, <laughs> when I was four, um, both my parents are in Los Angeles. And I would say that a lot of the things that I struggled with kind of started around that time. Um, okay. just having to navigate a divorce, which I know so many people, and I'm sure so many of your listeners experience and right. really find a sense of self in, in, in amidst that, um, not to mention, you know, just coming into the age of technology when I was in uh, middle school and high school, and just the craziness of the social media boom, which was, yeah. I think, in seventh grade is when <laughs> I was in seventh grade when that kind of started. And so you put all those factors together, and, um, and you get a lot of insecurity and a lot of anxiety yeah. and um, a lot of low self esteem. So I feel like it was a, ni a nice little melting pot for me. Sure, yeah. Well, you know, it seems like that's pretty common, right? Where, you know, I think all of us as kids, as we grow up, we're trying to find ourselves, we're trying to fit in. And, and I, it almost, and I hate to say it this way, but it almost feels like it's natural for us to overthink everything. Like, okay, I've got to be here. I've got to do this. I'll be happy if this happens. If it doesn't, then what am I going to do? And I watched an amazing video of you. Um, it was so cool. And you were talking about, you were saying like, if, if you're okay, then I can be okay. And so I'm always worried about what everybody thinks, right? And that kind of thing. And so I want, I want, I obviously want to delve more, delve more into that. But as you were progressing through this, I guess, struggle at times, how did, how did you find yourself and where did you get some help? And how did you get to a point where you actually wanted to help people? Yeah, no, I mean, that's such a good, good question. You know, I think the more work that I do and the more that I work with clients, um, it is the smartest of us who develop overthinking as a coping mechanism, right? It is okay. usually when you feel that you don't have a sense of control or predictability in your home environment or within yourself, and you want to feel more in control. You want things to be more on your terms. And a lot of people that struggle with that, the easiest place for them to go is into their heads 
where they can plan and prepare and yeah. iron things out and analyze things and ask questions all with the hope of, you know, if I worry about this, if I think about this, if I make sure X, Y, Z, right. I would be able to minimize pain that I am in. Um, and, and that I think is why so many people struggle with overthinking because even though it causes its own kind of pain, it is, it works. It's an effective distraction from a lot of emotional pain. Mm. Um, so it is, it's a numbing agent, but it's also, it gives you something to do when okay. things around you feel outside of your control. Um, so I think that's kind of like how, one of the first things that I started to notice is like, why am I in my head so much? Why mm. do I think about things three days after they've happened, replaying <laughs> what I said or didn't say, or right. how the person perceived it? Why am I worried about, so worried right now about something next week and how it may right. or may not go? And um, I feel really fortunate that I got into therapy very young. Okay. Um, and always kind of gravitated towards that work. And the things that have been most helpful for me, which I, I try to really incorporate into my coaching is getting to the things that are underneath the thinking. Right. So we spend so much time in our head and we think the thinking is the problem, but usually, you know, I, I, I joke sometimes that like anxiety is SAD's bodyguard. So usually a lot <laughs> of that overthinking and that overanalysis yeah. is, is actually protecting us from maybe some insecurity, some disappointment, some fear, some grief, some sadness. And the more tools you have to really learn how to sit with those feelings, the overthinking kind of eases its grip on you. Wow. Um, so that's probably been one of the most efficient things most helpful things that I've um, that I've gained and, and I try to pass on to the people I work with. Okay. Yeah, very well said. That's a very well put. I never thought of it that way, how it protects you from some of these things. And it's kind of like, like you said, it's kind of like one of those, uh, you know, things that, you know, we put in the way so we don't have to feel something, you know, typically. Um, you know, you mentioned that you know, you got into, th you, you actually did some therapy when you were younger, got in there young. Did you, is this something like where you, you know, you went to your parents even and say, Hey, I'm really struggling here and I need some help. Is that how that all kind of came about? You know, I don't remember exactly. I think okay. um, I was very anxious from a very young age. So I think it was pretty visible to anybody <laughs> who I came across. Um, yeah. Like I remember my first grade teacher, you know, during a parent teacher conference used to say, like Liana can't sit still. Like she's just, she's so jittery. She's always moving around during class. She can't really focus. Um, and they didn't really know what it was. You know, did I have ADD? Was I, what, what was the issue? And, and what I've come to see is that I was just really uncomfortable in my body. Okay. Um, and I also think, especially growing up in Los Angeles, which I'm really grateful for therapy was and <laughs> is pretty mainstream. Sure, yeah. um, and both, you know, my parents saw therapists so that there was no stigma or taboo around seeking out that help. Okay. And, and you know, I was a small person, but I had really big feelings coming out of my <laughs> parents' divorce. And I think, I think it was probably a mutual thing of like, I'm struggling. And then my parents also wanting to support me through the divorce and through right. the years after that with as much, as much support as I could get. Gotcha. Well, you know, and if it's okay, I'd love to talk to a little bit more about the divorce and not that we have to go into details about it, but more so, you know, I've had a lot of friends who have been divorced. I've, I've had family members who have been divorced. Like you said, a lot of these listeners hearing now have been through it. You know, that is a very traumatic experience for a lot of people. How did you handle that? I mean, again, you, you don't have to go into details of what happened or whatever, but more so, how did you make it through that? Was it really, was, was it therapy at that time? Or did you have friends you were reaching out to? Or did you just kind of deal with it you know, on your own? Mm -hmm. Well, I was four when it happened. So I was pretty young. And I think, um, okay, so well, you were really young. <laughs> yeah. But one of the things that I talk to a lot of my clients about is issues will creep up. Uh, you know, when you're 16, when you're 18, when you're 22 or 30, that yeah. can totally be traced back to things in your childhood. You know, one of my favorite quotes is like, if you don't deal with your childhood, your romantic relationships will. Um, oh, and wow. I, I, 
I 100% can attest that that's true. And so um, I've done a lot of the work, I think, kind of retrospectively. Um, I think at the time, therapy was really helpful. When I got in, I think I was around six or seven. Maybe. Okay. Um, I also, uh, my dad put me in dance classes around eight years old because I had all this energy from the anxiety and I didn't right. have to express myself. And, okay. um, and that was like one of the best things that, you know, he could have ever done for me and that I, I could have ever um, had. I think it really wasn't until I was in high school that I really started to open myself to spirituality and see you know, I know you talk on your podcast a lot about belief systems and like yeah. operating ideas and mm -hmm. a lot of the things that were going in, were happening in my head were just making my life so unmanageable and hard. And until I realized, like, I don't think everybody struggles in this exact way. Right. Was, was I able to start doing work, you know, on addiction that runs in my family and how that affected me? And, um, you know, my parents were not super amicable and, and what kind of triangulating role I had to play. So I would say the issues will come up if you don't deal with them when they first happen. And then you just kind of have to go backwards and, um, and take a look that way. Yeah. What was that quote again? Will you say that again? If you don't deal with it as, as a, you know, it's not, it's not my words. I've read okay. it somewhere. I not remember who, who wrote it, but um, okay. it says like, if you, if you don't deal with your childhood wounds, your romantic relationships will. Wow. That is, that is very powerful and profound and so true, unfortunately. <laughs> right. Unfortunately, I know. And, and it's because, you know, like, and, and kind of the basis of my work, which is attachment theory is that our early relationships and especially our relationships with our parents really color what kind of intimacy feels safe for us. And then, the, and you know, the stories and beliefs right. we have about people. Um, if we're afraid people are going to abandon us, or if we feel like we're judged, if we're imperfect, or, um, you know, if we feel engulfed by others and always need space, those yeah. kind, those are like templates that happen really early on. Yeah. And they're going to come up in our most intimate relationships, which tends to be in the romantic area. But, you know, I also work with people who struggle with these things in friendships or with colleagues at work or yeah. roommates, right? So um, I, I guess all your relationships kind of, uh, kind of end up dealing with your childhood wounds. Um, but definitely, I think most people have the most difficulty with, with romantic relationships. Right. Wow. Wow. Very well said. Thank you. Will you uh, talk about your experience with the 12 step recovery and then also get into, I'd love to hear more about this Buddhist meditation and how that really made an impact on you. Yeah. Um, so I feel super fortunate about this. When I was a junior in high school, I started going to a 12 step program called Al-Anon, which is designed for families and friends okay. um, who have been affected by alcoholism. And um, yeah, it was the first place in my life where I didn't feel crazy. Mm. Um, I really could not believe that other people's brains operated like my brain operated. Right. Um, and, and speaking of attachment, attachment theory, what kind of got me in or got encouraged me to go to my first meeting was that um, I had just gone through my a breakup, my first love, my high school <laughs> love. And right. um, I couldn't get out of bed for like three weeks. Like I was wow. so debilitated by this loss and um, I had such urgency and, and need to reconnect with this person. And, and I remember having the thought, I, I don't think other people experience breakups like this, like something else is going on. Um, and so I started going to Al-Anon then. Um, I just celebrated 12 years in the program, which is super exciting and something I'm really proud of. Yeah, congratulations. Uh, thank you, Todd. Thank you. Yeah, I'm I'm just a huge proponent of 12-step of recovery. I think it gave me a structure mm -hmm. and a community to learn these spiritual tools, which, you know, I try to teach my clients and hopefully won't take them 12 years. But um, <laughs> it also did start me on this spiritual path. So okay. I started to absorb more of Eastern religions and other non-denominational ideas. And then my junior year of college mm. um, for my semester abroad, I actually went and lived in a Buddhist monastery in India um, because I really wow. wanted to formally learn how to meditate. And, um, and that's and the I, place to go. If you want to oh, learn that, right. You. Everyone says like, <laughs> yeah, you want to, uh, 
you want to reach enlightenment, go to India. But I always, <laughs> I always joke that, you know, another expression, like wherever you go, there you are. Yeah. Um, it was a really intense experience. You know, I was living in this monastery and we had no phone and no TV and no technology <laughs> and wow. um, air conditioning and, life was bare, bare bones, minimalist. And um, what that does is it basically takes away all distractions and you hear your own thoughts really loudly. Yeah. Um, but I did develop a meditation practice and I was trained in Buddhist meditation there, which is something I incorporate into my coaching and into my work. Um, and so now my spirituality and my spiritual, you know, um, practice is like a hodgepodge of all these things. Right. And, uh, I'm, I'm a frequenter of the self-help aisle at Barnes and Noble. So there's a bunch of that <laughs> in there too. Right. Um, and I'm really a believer that you make, you make your own religion, you make your own belief system, you make your own, like you fill a toolbox with right. your own tools based off of your own fears and your own issues. And that toolbox is yours. Right. Wow. I love that. Um, and I love what you just said, uh, wherever you go, there you are. I think I heard that once from a guy named Alan Watts. Mm -hmm. I think I heard that, but I, it's, I love that. And it, if you really understand what that means, it's pretty profound, right? Yeah. And, and so much, I think of all addiction, but really anybody who mm -hmm. is seeking a sense of joy or fulfillment or sense of security in like any person, place, or thing, it's this illusion that there is some, that we can escape something that we're experiencing, right? I'm uncomfortable. So let me just right. reach for the food or I'm lonely. Let me just text the guy or I'm, yeah. you know, if I just get this, I'll feel better in my own skin. And what I learned through a lot of pain, especially when I was in India is that um, you can't really outrun yourself. And and I, and I work, you know, I work still, it's a lifelong process for me, but with my clients on like meeting those needs from an inside place as an inside job. So that when you are going to the relationship or going to work or, or doing all of these things, it's coming from a place of want rather than I need this to yeah. make, to make me feel better, gotcha. uh, which I've tried and, and it doesn't really work. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. Well, again, I told you, I really love what you do. And it sounds like a, a, a part of your focus, correct me if I'm wrong, is you want, you're helping people who struggle around dating. Yeah. And I think that is a big thing nowadays. I mean, you know, you, you throw COVID into the mix, you know, you people, you know, you got dating apps now, it's just, things are a little different, like, right. And, and I think a lot of people are really struggling around that area. And even before the COVID thing, and you obviously know more about this than me, but it, talk about that and your, you know, what your one-on-one -on -one private coaching looks like in that scenario. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, like I shared with you, I really got to my knees because romantic relationships were so painful for me. Yeah. Um, and I, I had so much anxiety around how, you know, men were perceiving me. I'm straight. So I'm, I, I'm saying men, but obviously it's, it's right. whoever one is pursuing. Um, and yeah. I needed their approval and their affirmation and them to like me to feel good about myself. And mm -hmm. I went to a lot of lengths to seek that out and, um, and lost my serenity and, and sense of self-esteem <laughs> in the process. Yeah. Um, you know, I later learned through through 12 step and through other things that, you know, that's a really common thing for people who struggle with codependency or who struggle with anxious attachment style, which is one of the attachment styles where, um, you know, based off of maybe not getting all your needs met in early childhood, you develop this hunger for other people to right. make you secure and confident and safe. Um, and that can really come up, I think, for people with dating, especially now that they're, everything is so swipeable and you can send four text messages in a row. You know, I don't think like my grandma was calling my grandpa five times because that would have been weird, but now it's, <laughs> it's, it's at our fingertips. So yeah. Um, it's so much easier to just get lost in that, like, chase for a relationship. So what I do yeah. with a lot of my one-on-one -on -one clients is helping them learn about their anxious attachment style and shift the focus from 
does the person like me? Are they going to choose me? Do they want to go on a third date with me? Right. Do they think I'm cool, funny, pretty smart to do I like them? Right. Does this work for me? Mm. A lot of people with an anxious attachment style really are good at focusing on what other people feel, want, and need. And it's really hard for them to ask themselves their own, those own questions, because there's a lot of fear of rejection and fear of abandonment. Yeah. And if, if that's the thing that's up, you're, you're dating from that place. You're dating from the, it has to work out. This needs to be my husband <laughs> or, or wife. I don't care if there is a red flag, I will paint it green because I just want this person to choose me. So we work to really switch that channel. And um, and a big way we do that is like developing an inside sense of self that's not dependent mm. on people that you're dating. So right. um, uh, developing a daily self-love and self-care practice is something I, I do in my one-on-one -on -one program. Um, a journaling practice, an affirmation practice, a starting to really look at when I am feeling really obsessed with what the guy thought of me or if he's going to text me, what's really going on with me? Yeah. How do I really feel about myself right now? What ideas about myself are coming up? How can I tend to myself and soothe that part of myself and be kind to myself rather than just wanting him to text me so I can feel okay? So mm. um, it's really equipping them with tools to develop self-esteem and self-love from the inside out rather than from the outside in. Wow. I love that. That sounds amazing. Talk about, I'm, I'm really interested, you know, you, you're doing a lot there, but talk a little bit about that daily self-love practice. What does that look like? Mm -hmm. So this is one of the things I feel really fortunate to have learned early on in Al-Anon. Um, and I know in the self-help industry and in the psychology industry, self-love is like thrown around, like, just love yourself, just love yourself. <laughs> and like right. for years, I just did not understand how, I mean, the inner critic is so loud, at least in my head, still to this day, still 12 years in, I'm working with it every day. Sure. Um, so just telling myself to love myself didn't really work for me. Right. Um, something that has been so much more helpful and tangible is learning how to be friends with myself. Mm. Um, and I learned that through actions, the same way you become friends with people at school or in college or at work by calling them, spending time with them, supporting them, asking them questions, encouraging them, giving them positive affirmation or reinforcement. That is how you build a friendship with yourself. So um, I have all of my clients do like morning and evening journaling routines. Um, one of my signature things is something called the five, five and five, which is every evening jotting down five things you're grateful for, which hones your perspective and perception. Five things you did well that day, okay. which balances out the part of the mind that's constantly criticizing you as not enough or not good enough. Okay. And five things you love about yourself because our brains just, my brain just doesn't go there unless I'm right. working that muscle. And you do this every night and you start to become a person that you respect and that you like. Yeah. And, and I really am a believer that self-esteem or self-love is built through like esteemable actions. Mm. So I, I also walk my clients through not only those two routines every day, but I encourage them to have a, a date night with self once a week. Um, we do a lot of letter writing. So they're writing letters to themselves um, and to the parts of themselves uh, that maybe they feel, you know, people they date judge or that they're right. embarrassed about. So loving those kind of like normally uh, like embarrassing parts of themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also really look at behavior as like the third component of the self-love and self-care practice. So like I mentioned, I think self-esteem is built through esteemable acts and, um, and that can come in a lot of shapes and sizes. That could be the courage to speak up when someone says something that doesn't make you feel good and and setting a boundary or express right. yourself. That's an esteemable act. Um, it could be ending a relationship that doesn't feel fun for you. It could be having the courage to ask someone out that you really love. <laughs> so I help them identify these little, what I call contrary actions on a daily basis um, because the self-esteem then kind of develops on its own because you start feeling good about how you're showing up in your life, regardless of what the other person is thinking or perceiving. 
Dang. Uh, like, man, that was so well said. I love that five, five and five. And it reminds me of something I've been taught and I teach to my clients as well is what we focus on increases. A hundred percent. Right. And that's why I love your five, five and five, you know, five things you're grateful for five things you did well and five things that you love about yourself. And, and you do that on a daily basis. Like how could you not, I mean, it would almost be impossible not to feel a little bit better actually. Right. hundred percent. And honestly, and I I've been doing that practice almost every night for 12 years and I'm going to steal know, that from you, by the way, just so oh, you know. I, please and, I'll, do. and I'll give you full credit. <laughs> it, takes, it takes less than a minute. And, um, and you know what, Todd, some days things I did well, I can't really think of anything. I literally will write, I brushed my teeth twice or I ate three right. meals or I showed up for my job. And you know what? That counts too. It doesn't all right. have to be, I broke up with my toxic partner <laughs> or, you know, I finished yeah. my senior thesis. Like it's small things too, small ways that you showed up for yourself, that you were a good friend to yourself. And with the things okay. that I love about myself, some days it's not, you know, I have the most beautiful hair. Or like I'm an amazing friend. Some days it's really like, I love that I ate a meal when I was hungry. Right. I love that held the door open for an, an, someone who's elderly and like did something kind. Like it's like you see the world, how you see yourself. And right. so the, like, it's about honing the lens. Okay. Cause then you go out into your life. And if you do this practice for one minute a night, every night, you're just like, you'll, something will happen. And you'll, you'll just think like, cause you're preparing to make that list. You'll, you'll just think like, Oh, that was good that I did that. I'm really proud of myself. And you won't even know where that thought kind of came from. And then, then you're feeling good about yourself throughout the day and throughout the week. Um, it just, it changes the channel. Yeah. Wow. Well, Liana, you're so well-spoken and I failed to mention that a lot of your work's been featured in Huffington Post, Thought Catalog, Elephant Journal, Medium, and so much more. And I can see why um, you're very well thought out and you, you really, you have a really great way of explaining things in a very simplistic form. And I think that's probably why you're so good at what you do. Thanks, Todd. Yeah. I mean, I, before I got to kind of some of these spiritual tools, I read every single book that I could find <laughs> about anxiety and about insecurity yeah. and about dependency on others. I went to so many different therapists and I think it, if it's not practical, I'm not going to use it. Yeah. And, and, um, and my brain's already super complicated. So <laughs> the simple right. tools and simple ideas yeah. help cut through that clutter. And um, that's been the, what's been most helpful for me. And so I, I try to, to carry that forward. Gotcha. I, I have a curious question here. Do you have like a morning routine that you do? Like, I think my, a lot of people might be thinking, okay, man, this girl sounds pow powerful. Um, what does she do? What does her day look like? And I know you mentioned some things you do in the evening, your five, five and five and some other things, but it, do you have like a morning ritual or a morning routine that you do? Yes. And I'm very imperfect at it, which is good. It's good <laughs> for my perfectionism to say that out loud because um, <laughs> good job. I do have the brain that is sometimes like, oh, I haven't done it for two days. It's ruined. I messed it all up. So I say yeah. that anyone listening, you can start over at any time. Yeah. Um, I am a really big fan of the morning pages from mm. Julia Cameron's The Artist's Way. It's basically oh, three, yeah. page of, three pages of stream of consciousness. Mm. Sometimes I write to God. Sometimes I write to myself. Sometimes I literally just vent about the most irritating, superficial things. But the right. point is, and her whole philosophy is that your only job is to write three pages. You don't need to judge it. It doesn't need to be good. You don't need to figure anything out. And so it kind of takes me out of that like critical part of myself. Mm. Um, I also, I try to meditate on mo most mornings. So I alternate between like the Headspace app if I want something a little bit more simple. Okay. I also am a really big fan of um, a Buddhist teacher. Her name is Tara Brock and she has hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of meditations on po on her podcast, on, po on, the, on the Apple store, or on Spotify. Right all around self-compassion, which I know we didn't really touch on that much, but I just want right. to say that, that uh, there is nothing that I've worked on that self being nice to myself has not helped. 
Sure. And so, and it's really unnatural for me and for most of the women that I work with. And so I really like her meditations because they are really about self-compassion. Um, mm. From there, I read, um, I, I read a couple like daily spiritual readers um, and, and, you know, I have some Buddhist books that I'll just read a page out of just to get like some good sentences in my ears. Um, and that's kind of it, you know, okay. and I'm also a really big believer, like you can stop and check in with yourself at any time. And mm -hmm. I learned early on, you can start your day over at any time. So I've sometimes done this routine at four o'clock in the afternoon because I'm in a really bad mood and <laughs> sure. really incredible. Um, so I try not to be too, I try not to be too perfectionistic about it and just like ask myself, like, what would help me feel the most connected to myself right now? And sometimes that's five minutes and sometimes that's an hour long thing. And um, it looks different every day. Wow. I love it though. I, I think, you know, a lot of people, you know, kind of what you're doing, you know, coaching and things like that, you know, do something like that every morning. Like there's something that you do to work on you, which kind of sets the tone for the day. So you can be there for other people. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I love that. You know, so what, tell us some of the coaching programs that you do do. Is it just mainly around dating or do you have other, other avenues that you use your coaching with? Yeah. Well, I'm currently in an expansion period right now. So when I, I, I'm a relatively new coach actually, but um, when I started, I kind of wanted to hone in on like a particular problem, which was, you know, this anxious attachment style, this low self sense of self, this, yeah. um, needing for approval and people pleasing as it relates to dating. And then what I started to find is that people would be messaging me, oh, but I struggle with this with my boss, or I always am afraid my friends are hanging out with me or are mad at me, or I have fear of missing out, or I'm always people pleasing with my mom because I don't want her to be disappointed in me. And I realized that people aren't really talking about anxious attachment outside of romantic relationships, but it, right. for me, it, it does appear in all, all areas of my life. So um, I'm in the process of building out a group coaching program, um, which will launch in the next couple of months that will be honed in on one of these aspects of anxious attachment. Um, probably, you know, building an internal validation system. Um, right. we'll teach a lot of the same tools like the five, five and five, the daily routine, the different concepts around being friends with yourself and self-compassion and self-trust and intuition, but not so narrowed in on dating because I think it really helps across, across areas. So that's kind of what's next um, oh, cool. on the horizon for me. And, um, also super inspired by you and makes me, makes me want to start a podcast on this, um, uh, you know, around this topic around this yeah. topic too. So maybe that's in my 2021 plans as you well. Really, you really should. One, you're very well spoken. And I think, like you said, a lot of this isn't talked a lot about. So I think you would have a really powerful platform because, you know, people would really gravitate towards that. Cause like I said, I've been doing this a long time, not necessarily the podcast, but more of coaching and life coaching and mentoring for 30 plus years now. And anxiety is like, it's like the, one of the main things every client I deal with struggles with. Yeah. And so something like that would be amazing. I think, I think you'd be great at it. You, again, you got a really good, powerful voice. <laughs> I so appreciate that. No. And I, I love talking to people and hearing, cause I'm still collecting, you know, experience, strength and hope too. Like, you know, one thing that's really important to me as a coach and is I don't pretend that I don't struggle with this stuff. Right. Um, especially in my writing, I, I don't like, and it gets a little weird with life coaching because people want like a guarantee, you know, like after eight weeks, I am going to have X, Y, and Z. And I can't promise you the boyfriend or the girlfriend. I can't promise you the job or mm. the car or the amount of income earned. I also can't promise you that your anxiety will be gone. I don't, I think I'll probably have this on some level for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. um, but what I do promise you is that and this is what I was given. And I, I try to just carry it forward is that like, it's not about having anxiety. It's about having tools to treat yourself differently when you have anxiety to right. respond to situations instead of react to situations. It's, it's truly just about filling a toolbox. Um, 
So yeah, that's something that I, you know, and it's hard to speak so candidly about my struggles and, you know, I'm yeah. still in the dating world and like yeah. having my Prince Charming. So, so a lot <laughs> of it is personal experience, sure. um, but I learn most from the people who are in, you know, they say, they say in 12 step recovery, a lot, like be in the middle of the boat. So I learn a lot from people who are in the middle of the boat, who are yeah. walking the talk and practicing and failing mm -hmm. and talking about what works for them and what doesn't. And um, I'm really grateful for my Instagram community for that reason, because they give me a lot of ideas. You know, people that comment sure. give me a lot of ideas too. No, that's awesome. Very well said. I think, again, another reason why you're so good at what you do is you do talk about your struggles. You do talk about, hey, I'm going through this too. And I think people love you, people who are real and genuine, right? And so, I think people can relate obviously with you, but then at the same time, you've put in some work and, you know, put paid some prices here to get you to a point where you can help other people as well. So I think you got the, like the perfect combination going there. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, you know, I want to have share the solution and I also want people to know that they're not alone. Yeah. And, um, and I don't want to give the false impression that this completely goes away, but yeah. I will say I would not give up, give back any of my issues if it meant not having the deep spiritual practice in life that I have. So yeah. that's kind of like what I tell anybody. It's like, you will be grateful for this pain yeah. because the, the tools and the sense of self and the self knowledge that's going to come out of this is actually going to be, it's going to be more than worth it. And that's, that's been true for me too. Even when I'm in it, I just have to remind myself like, learning about myself and getting closer to myself and learning more about life through my pain and my experiences is just, there is unfortunately no other way to get that wisdom and right. you have to walk through the pain sometimes. Yeah, for sure. Well, you know, it, it reminded me what you just said about people who kind of feel alone. You go back to when you first started doing the Al-Anon program, that 12 step program, you for the first time, you're like, well, Hey, I'm not crazy. I'm, I, I didn't feel alone. You didn't feel alone anymore. Right. And with that said, it, it poses this next question I have for you. If there's someone listening to you right now who feels alone, who is struggling with anxiety and, you know, struggling because they're not perfect and they can't shut their mind off and they're just having a rough time. What, what advice could you give someone right now? Who's listening to you, Liana, share your story with us. Yeah. Um, well, I so know what that feels like. Um, mm. I think that our temptation when we are in pain, we want to make the pain go away. And so we have picked up a lot of tool, a lot of ways that we think is going to make the pain go away faster. Mm -hmm. And um, self-judgment is one of those self-criticism, uh, blaming ourselves being hard on ourselves. And, you know, I, I had a teacher many years ago when I was going through a really hard time say to me, and if I could get a tattoo, if I was going to get a tattoo, it would say this, say, say, said to me, this is not the time to abandon yourself. Wow. Um, and, wow. you know, I think that's what I would say to someone who's really struggling right now is the pain's not going to go away right now, this minute, it's not going to go away. Mm -hmm. But what you can choose is, are you going to hold your own hand and be on your own team and be your own friend as you walk through this? Or are you going to abandon yourself, you know? Mm -hmm. And, right. um, and, and the, like I said before, like me being mean to myself is 90% of all of my problems. And any problem that I am having that's not that, me being mean to myself or judging myself or hating this part of me that struggles makes whatever problem I'm experiencing so much worse. So I would say, can that person for one minute just right now find some gentleness and compassion for the fact that they're doing the very best they can and that it's okay and that they're okay and that the pain will, will resolve itself but like right now is not the time to abandon yourself. Wow. That is beautifully said, Liana. Wow. It gave me chills. Honestly, this is not the time to abandon yourself. 
And I, you know, and I love that because, you know, as we both know, especially what's kind of going on in the world right now, a lot of people are stressed out. You know, people are going through some really difficult times with, you know, with the pandemic and things like that. And I think this isn't for all of us and anyone listening to this, this is not the time for us to abandon ourselves. And so if, if someone is, you know, wants to reach out to you, Liana, and ask you a question or start doing some of your coaching programs with you, what's the best way for them to reach out to you? Yeah. Um, I am on Instagram all the time at Liana Gurgley. I'm sure that'll be in the show notes or somewhere easy to access. Yep. Um, so please send me a DM. Um, you can email me straight from my Instagram page. We can find a time to chat. Um, I do free discovery calls with anyone who resonates with this stuff and is curious to learn more about me and my coaching. Um, I'll also be posting on there information about my upcoming workshops and my upcoming group program. Um, but I, I love talking to you and helping you reason things out. Um, so please, please don't hesitate to send me a, a private message. And um, cause you don't, you really don't have to, to struggle with this alone. Wow. Love it. Love it. Well, Liana, I can't thank you enough for taking some time out of your busy schedule to sit down with us and, you know, share your, you know, your struggles, but also your triumphs. And, and then I love, like I said, I love how real you are. Um, that really helps me too, because I think sometimes I need to be a little more real. So it was a good reminder to me as well. So thank you for what you do and trying to help other people. And uh, I, I just love your vulnerability. It's really refreshing, actually. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to chat with you. And um, I admire your work so much. And you thank really you. have such a wonderful assortment of, of people that you speak with on this podcast. And um, and you're making the world a better place. So I'm, I'm grateful to have had a chance to be a part of it. Thank you. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll keep trying to do that together in any future endeavors. Um, I'd love to help you out any way that I can. So please don't hesitate, Liana, to, to let me know. If you're ever in Utah, please let me know. And I you, can will. Come, you, you can come see the live studio. And <laughs> I will. But and you, uh, might, you might want to escape the cold in California. Yeah, so. that might be better. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll stick with the West Coast for right now. I but don't you're, you're welcome here anytime. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank well, you. Um, yeah, thank you. Well, there you go, folks. There's another amazing person, Liana Gurgley. Thank you uh, for tuning in. Please reach out to her. Um, I guarantee you, everyone on who's listening to this has dealt with anxiety or is still struggling with it. Please reach out to her. She's obviously got a wealth of knowledge. And just like you heard her, she's very real and authentic and you will love that. She'll be a very safe person for you to reach out to. So please do that. And I just want to thank all of you for tuning in week after week. I love you guys. Thank you for believing in me. And Liana, um, good luck to everything that you're doing. And we're here to support you all along the way. Thank you so much, Todd. Thank you. Gotcha. All right. Till next time, guys.